So let's have a look at what dementia is. So this is, you know, the guy on the left, Charlton Heston, and the guy on the right is Ronald Reagan, and they were together, this must have been in the 1980s, uh, and within a couple of years they were both in, more or less, in homes with Alzheimer's disease. So, shh. So the question is, is Alzheimer's catching? <laughs> so, uh, are they... Uh, it's very common. Dementia is a broad category of brain disease that causes long-term and often gradual decrease in the ability to think and remember, such as a person's daily functioning. Other common symptoms include emotional problems, language, decrease in motivation. It's usually divided up in dementia into mostly Alzheimer's disease, although the official diagnosis of Alzheimer's can only be done at autopsy. So not usually done... So a lot of people with dementia are just called Alzheimer's, but there is no one definitive test, apart from the seroid, uh, serum amyloid protein um, is thought to be, but you know, nothing is definitive. So Alzheimer's disease really makes up 50 to 70% of cases. So what are the rest? Possibilities are vascular dementia, which probably makes up the vast majority of them, which means basically a lack of oxygen, which is what the the blood does is to deliver oxygen to the brain. Now my granny many years ago um, went a, a little funny in the head, I was only a youngster and she would say very strange things sometimes in the house and uh, sometimes would uh, you know get herself muddled up and sometimes wander the streets at night you know and she ended up in a, in a nursing home or in a home and they said she's got vascular dementia caused, they said at that time, from hardening of the arteries. But we now know that people get hardening in arteries and they may get a decreased blood flow, but they're still quite compassmentous. They may get a bit of dizziness and things. But really what vascular dementia is, is this lack of oxygen. Okay, these people have got hypoxia. And old people, of course, are, uh, are, are keys for getting hypoxia. Because how we get blood, around, or oxygen rather, around with blood, is through hemoglobin. And hemoglobin needs a lot of nutrients to convert glycine and uh, succinyl CoA from the Krebs cycle into the various heme molecules, or porphyrins as they're called. We need a lot of pyridoxal 5 phosphate, a lot of B6, and a lot of B12. And B12 is only in animal products, and it's only really in meat, and it's only really in red meat. And it doesn't matter what anybody says, whether you're vegetarian, vegan, you should take B12 if you are a vegetarian or a vegan, because you will not get sufficient B12 from anything apart from red meat. If you muscle test chicken, you certainly won't get it, or any other eel or fish. You can do all the muscle testing, all the books will tell you, oh yes, it's in meat, it's in fish, less so in cheese and eggs and so on. It's not. You just muscle test it and see, because you will not strengthen when you show signs of B12 deficiency. So you have to take it. And of course, the best sources of B12 are wild meats. This is what we should be designed to eat, and organ meats, which very few people eat anymore. So venison is very good, pigeon, uh, pheasant, you know, rabbit, hare, all these things are wonderful sources of B12. Okay, so that's one of the major reasons. Iron less so. Iron doesn't, you know, get iron deficiency is, is rare unless you're hemorrhaging the, the heavy menstrual periods and things. People don't necessarily get iron deficiency that often. And a lot of things have iron supplemented into them. But we do get a lot of B12. A lot of B12. You know, after magnesium, zinc, and B6, or pyridoxal 5 phosphate, you know, adenosyl, methyl, hydroxycobalamin are well up there in the, in the nutrients that I prescribe. So they're pretty much um, very, very, very common deficiency. So that would be the vascular dementia. Then there's a few less common ones like frontal temporal dementia, Lewy body dementia, um, hydrocephalus, Parkinson's disease, syphilis, krautsfeld jakob's disease, or mad cow disease. But most of them are classified as either Alzheimer's or vascular dementia, and I think a lot are just vascular dementia. I would put a lot more people with um, uh, neurological dementia symptoms as just B12 deficiency, really. But there are some who definitely are more brain degeneration. So we know causes around 0.1% of cases are familiar. This is very small. 
One thing for sure is that Alzheimer's is not really by anybody considered to be a genetic. There are a few genetic predispositions to it, but there is not a gene called Alzheimer's gene or whatever. If there was, you would have got it in early childhood. So just remember this, with a genetic problem, it will manifest itself early in your life, certainly under 50, <coughs> but if not under 10. If a problem develops later in your life, it's not a genetic problem. On the other hand, it can be that genes that we carry can be hidden or suppressed because they've got caps on, like methyl caps they're called, on the gene. And as we get older, these caps may become loosened. And these caps are made of methyl groups, which again needs B12, folic acid, and P5P, pyridoxal 5-phosphate. So it's possible that the caps could expose themselves so genes that we don't want expressed could become expressed later on in life if we become deficient in those because we don't eat the right food. And old people, of course, don't eat the right food, particularly when they're left on their own, or heaven help them if they go into a home. Because if they go into a home, you might as well forget any nutrition. You know, it is really, really disastrous. They're not getting any, anything of any vital. So, uh, very few cases, in other words, on research has been shown to be due to genetics. Um, so very few people would have an onset early on. Between 40 and 80% of people with Alzheimer's disease possess at least one possibility, which is an APOE4 expression of the gene. So we put APOE4 allele, which we'll have a look in, which doesn't allow people to metabolize cholesterol and triglycerides and uh, toxic metal fragments, as well as what they should do. And APOE4 is an expression which is in the red body type. I think Jill talked a little bit about this. People, as we know, are divided into red, green, and blue body types or constitution, and this is the red body type. The red body type has the APOE4 allele. We have that in the kits, um, so you can always test a person with APOE4 uh, to know whether you've actually got APOE4, which means you've got a predestination, if you like, to having a buildup of cholesterol uh, and triglycerides and a buildup accumulation of aluminium. So this is why people in red people with Alzheimer's, they've often found there's a high level of aluminium in the brain, but they don't know whether that's a cause or an effect. And nobody knows, except it's probably not good to have aluminium in the brain, but it may be that they just simply can't get rid of it. And as Jill said, 60 to 70% of the dry weight of the brain is fat. So where do you store toxins if you can't get rid of them? In your body fat. And of course, one of the places of that is the brain. So you stick the stuff that you don't want to get or you can't get rid of in there. So there is a predisposition, but nobody thinks that APOE4 is the cause. It just happens to be uh, a factor. Head injuries do increase the risk. Okay, so there's a distinct chance that if you uh, had an accident or you were a footballer um, or had a lot of head injuries, judo, uh, this sort of thing where you hit your head a lot. Uh, oxidative stress and inflammation, yes, we know that. Insulin resistance, yes, because your blood sugar level goes up, glycation goes up. The microbiome, in other words, a dysbiosis uh, in the gut, you know, altered bacteria, yes. Nutritional imbalances, yes, particularly in the DHA, as we've seen. Allergy intolerance, yes, especially gluten has, has had a lot of investigation antibodies to gluten. Uh, methylation defects, yes, that's the ones with the caps on. So the caps may come off in later life if you then have a change in your life period, menopausal, hormonal changes, when your body may need more B12 and folates and B6s. Toxicity, especially due to mercury and uh, DDT. Okay? So we know that DDT um, builds up in uh, Alzheimer's brain's mercury, and that should have aluminium in there as well. Okay, on the left is a normal brain, and the same age person on the right with Alzheimer's disease. So you can see it's basically it's a shrinkage. But that doesn't mean you've got Alzheimer's because your brain shrunk. There's a professor of mathematics at Manchester United, or Manchester United, Manchester University. <laughs> Thinking about it. Manchester University, who is has got an undetectable brain. There is no brain in there. He had hydrocephalus in the 1950s as a youngster. They did a shunt 25 years ago, 25 years after the shunt was put in. And they re they invented scans by that time. They were able to scan. They couldn't find a brain in there. It was just around the periphery of the cranium. And he's a professor of mathematics. 
So it depends what you got in there, <laughs> not the amount. Okay? So there's hope for us all. Okay? So the size of the brain actually doesn't matter. It, it matters what you do with it. Okay? So there's the tau hypothesis which proposes proteins abnormalities which initiate the disease cascade. In this model, hyperphosphorylated tau begins to pair with each other and form threads. This is a theory here. Uh, when this occurs, the microtubules disintegrate, destroying the structure, uh, and collapses in the system. And this can be the effect of mercury toxicity. So we know that toxins in the brain can create changes within the protein structures. Uh, higher education decreases the risk. So the more seminars you come on, especially epigenetic ones, you're decreasing the risk every seminar you come on of developing Alzheimer's. Research in California has shown that almost 90-year-olds but most 90 years do not have dementia. So you've got to keep going to 90. Okay? After that, you're excused from coming to so many seminars. <laughs> Alzheimer's degenerative changes begin in the hippocampus. That's the part where this, like the, the rear stat, if you like, of the memory, where it comes back from the frontal cortex and wherever. And we don't know where memory is stored, but we know it works through the system and particularly through the hippocampus and that is rich in acetylcholine neurons. So it starts, which starts to shrink. So short-term memory is affected first of all. The brain loses its plasticity. This is its ability to use other neurons, so to change. And every time we have a thought, every seminar you come on, everything you do changes the network in the brain. So you start to use things. Hopefully you've learned things that you've never learned before, or some information, and that will open up networks. And you know, every time you f hear that information again, that network will become hardwired. Okay, so thoughts and memories actually become hardwired in, into the brain. Neurons, dendrites actually grow them. So the brain uses its plasticity and its ability to make connections between the neurons. And many will die, the neurons are. Decline occurs because of learned non-use. I got a bad leg so I don't use it. You'll lose it. You learn not to use something because you can't use it. So now we begin to think, ah, if we can't use it and I don't use it, I'll lose it. Okay? It's as simple as that. So you, sometimes you've got to train people to use it. So how do you get somebody to, say, use an arm that's painful? Is you strap the other one up to the side so they've got to use it. Okay? This was the lazy eye. Did you have a lazy eye patch? Lots of children had lazy eye patches. Did you have a lazy eye patch? Yes, yes. How many people are nodding? You have one? No. See, what you do is you don't put the patch on the bad eye, you put it on the good eye. So they can't use the good eye, so they have to work the muscles on the, on the bad eye. And this is the theory. And this is to take the non-use, stimulate, get the non-use out. Noisy brain or brain dysrhythmia. This means a lot of background radiation going on. Background chitter-chatter, chitter-chatter. Any tissue damage, any inflammation, uh, any thought process where you've got conflict going on between the left and the right hemisphere. This is bad. It's going on all the time. People don't rest. You know, when you've gone through a lot of emotional trauma, you wake up in the morning and you think, two or three seconds, it's great. And then it starts. And you say, consciously, you don't want it to start, but it starts. And it's the memories which are coming, just coming up because you're, you're heightened, your subconscious is heightened, or your memories. And that's subconscious, okay? They're memories. There's nobody in there, it just chatters. And it's an argument between the left brain and the right. The right brain sees things one way, with the more complex side of things, uh, the context. Um, and the left brain sees the, the concepts, the, the narrow linear aspects of things, the fine details. So one's saying one thing, one's saying the other, and it's an argument. So what we do is, right at the beginning, when we look at a patient, is we find out their constitution, and then we therapy localize the amygdala on the greater wing of the sphenoid on the right to the left, and then the left to the right. And if the person goes weak in one of those, they've got a conflict in their subconscious emotion. They've got noise going on, and they'll tell you, oh yeah, I can just sit back and listen to this lot going on. It's almost as if there's somebody else in there. And it is, it's their memories just playing through. And you can wallop it, you can hit it, you can do whatever you want. It won't turn it off. But luckily the mirror on light like we did before does do that. So you put the therapy localized like we did with Anna, is we therapy localize the greater wing of the sphenoid on one side to the other, the one that goes weak, and then one, one minute of the mirror on light. And that puts in that violet flame which balances the turmoil between the left and the right. 
So that violet is a very healing colour. And we know that because that's what people see when they meditate. When they get to that perfect rest between the left and the right hemisphere, they start to see that colour. But you don't see it with your eyes, you see it with your mind. Okay, so that's, that when, if you see that colour, you will know that you're in a good, relaxed state. Number three, absence of rapid formation of neuronal assemblies. Every mental act creates a different network. So the more you stimulate the brain, the better. So even the smallest things, if you've learned something, you've created a new network, and that's the most important thing. So the most impressive protection from cognitive decline was, and this was in order, exercise. And this was really interesting, wasn't it? Because most people are told, oh, you must take things easy. Go and sit yourself down, you rest. You might as well kill the person off. The fastest thing, the best, most important thing was exercise. More important than anything else was walking two miles a day or cycling ten miles a day. So they followed a whole group of people, as you'll see, over many years, and this was done at Cardiff University, and these people had less cognitive decline. Yeah? A healthy diet, uh, five a day, that's not cigarettes. <laughs> that <laughs> is fruit and veg, organic, uh, obviously. Normal body weight, low alcohol, no smoking. Those are the five most important things that they found. So, walking reduces the risk of dementia by 60%. Okay, following several thousand men between the ages of 40 and 59, testing them every five years for 30 years. Now this is the important, why do they do men? Because actually more women get Alzheimer's than men, believe it or not, it's much more frequent amongst women. Maybe because they live longer <laughs> than men. But it's interesting this was done on men on the study. But the thing is that walking reduced the risk by 60%. Why do you think that is? That's a question. Rhetorical question, you don't have to answer it. <laughs> why, why do you think? Oh, oxygen? Yes, good, I, I agree there, oxygen. What? Left, right, right brain, yes, a lot of stimulate, um, you know, changing non use. Huh? Sunlight. sunlight, yes, sunlight being outside, yeah. Inflammation. What? Inflammation? Circulation. Oh, circulation, yes, yeah. It, it, it's getting better, isn't it? ATP? Well, you've got to have the ATP to be able to do it, true. But there's one other, and I, I didn't realise this until I was sort of studying this, and then I realised uh, what this very simple thing was, of course is when you walk or you exercise, you're contracting your muscles. And what's the stimulant, what's the neurotransmitter that works the neuromuscular junctions? Acetylcholine. So what do you do when you exercise? You increase your acetylcholine production. Okay? And that's what's missing in so many cases with memory problems. All right? So now we're going to think all those good things that you mentioned, oxygen, um, et cetera, et cetera, light, the whole thing is, is a good package. But the other package is, when you're losing something, you've got to use it, otherwise you get disused. The important thing with dementia, if it's associated with low levels of acetylcholine, is you've got to stimulate acetylcholine in them. So yes, you look at the acetyl and the codeine and the factors that make acetylcholine, but you've got to stimulate the nerves which are involved with that. So this is one of the most important things. This is why they found that doing um, jigsaw puzzles and things, crosswords and things, is much more important than reading or, worst of all, watching television. Watching television, you put no effort in at all. There's not even a slight glimmer of light going on in there. Um, so you have to put... And the best, of course, way of stimulating is talking, is people together. And this is the sadness of this, is so often this happens in people who are on their own because they've got nobody to communicate with. When you have to talk, you have to liven your brain up. Okay? You can't just sit there while she chatters away. You want to chatter away of it. And she's going to ask you questions, and you're going to chatter, and you're going to remember things all the time. And that's all acetylcholine. Remember, you're stimulating your memories. That's the important thing. OK, so aerobic exercise is really important. And turmeric. So here we go, turmeric again. Now, why turmeric? Because it contains two compounds, curcuminoids and turberones. Uh, and the curcuminoids have been shown to actually stimulate cell, uh, stem cell growth in the brain. So neurogenesis can be stimulated by curcuminoids, which are rich in turmeric. That's the good news. The bad news is you've got to have a lot of it. And because we probably only absorb one-tenth of what you take. So if you were to get need 
one capsule's worth, 500 milligrams, you would need to take 10 of those. Now some people then found that research that if you add um, Boswellia, which is frankincense, to it, you can reduce the amount of turmeric, in other words you get a greater absorption. And piperin, which is the active component of pepper, does the same thing. But we found the best one was black cumin seed, which is got, it's a peppery like taste, but it's not piperin that's in it. But 50% black cumin seed, 50% turmeric is all you need, and it reduces it dramatically. So if a patient strengthens, let's say, to two capsules of that smart turmeric, as it's called, they're actually only getting one capsule because they're getting a greater absorption of what they're doing. Otherwise, you can mix it in water, you can mix it in juice, you can mix it with egg, yolk, and all sorts of things. There's many ways of actually getting it in, and it is all disgusting. <laughs> Turmeric is not a pleasant spice. If you drop it anywhere, it's stained you know, completely. Uh, if you put it on a work surface, it stains. It's very powerful stuff. Um, but in a capsule, it's not so bad. I'm putting it into things. So you, what I do is I just open the capsule up. I put it into mayonnaise or whatever it is that I'm making. And people say, oh, that's a nice bright colour, isn't it? You know, <laughs> so it's the eggs that I use. You know. <laughs> okay, so turmeric is a wonderful thing. But one thing, you know, I read this on the Alzheimer's Society in the paper, and I was saying, turmeric, turmeric, turmeric. And what we found is it never worked. And I couldn't work out why there was all this fuss about turmeric until we started using organic turmeric. And then people strengthened. And I realized it's the pesticides that the turmeric, being a tuber or a root, it absorbs from the soil. Now, they don't necessarily spray, although the stories are that they do spray it, but they don't necessarily spray it up. But like all root crops, it takes up chemicals from the ground. So if the ground has been used for other purposes and it's toxic, it takes it up into the roots, and then you have it. And if you take turmeric in, which is non-organic, it may not work, and it may do actually some harm. So the first thing I learned is, must have it organic, must. Don't even begin to contemplate it if it's not. And it works much, much better if you take it with black cumin seed. You can take it with the other things, but you need to it much more. And if you don't take it with anything, it'll work, but you need 10 times the amount. So exercise and turmeric are two simple things. If people say two things, what should I do? That's the best thing you can do, is to exercise regularly. Remember, two miles um, regularly and we'll see in a minute how you build that up, uh, and taking turmeric to stimulate brain neurogenesis. Exercise stimulates the production of glial-derived neurotrophic factor. These are uh, proteins which have been found to be stimulated on exercise, and brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Now, these stimulate new brain cells and connections. So this is important, so exercise stimulates this. Increased running and environmental enrichment um, reduces the loss of acetylcholine and dopamine cells. So when you do your exercise, you don't do the same walk or run every day. Okay? First thing is you need to rest in between, so you don't do it every day, you do it every two days. You try and build up to your two miles or so, and you vary your route. Okay? You do not, or you try not to do the same route every time, because it comes routine. There's no stimulation there. So sometimes you want to walk over grass, sometimes around the playing field, sometimes through the woods. Just do anything which is a bit different. Right? So the more varied it is, the more stimulation it is, and the more unusual movements, the more muscle contractions you're using, which will stimulate more acetylcholine. Small stresses prepare the body for greater stresses, and therefore stimulate growth, such as walking fast and breaking into a sweat. Okay? So in other words, a bit of stress is good, but obviously not too much stress tires you out and um, you know, pushes you over the top. But small stress has been prepared, it's been shown to actually prepare the body f ready for bigger stress, which means that certain hormones will go up, which stimulates neurogenesis. Continuous stress, on the other hand, is bad, especially if it increases uh, cortisol too high. Most growth is in the hippocampus that turns short memory into long-term memories, and in the basal ganglion, especially the striatum. That's what we saw in the picture earlier. Exercise increases learning proportion of the uh, uh, derived neurotrophic factors. A combination of learning and exercise maintains brain plasticity. So remember brain plasticity is the using of neuronal pathways which haven't developed um, or have only partially developed, so they're like bypass routes. So things are always changing all the time. Learning turns on genes that express more neurotrophic factors, uh, facilitating learning. 
So learning turns on genes that express more neurotrophic factors and facilitate learning. The more you learn, the better you become at learning. That's what I said you know, to you earlier. This is why it was easy when I used to teach at uh, the British School of Osteopathy. Uh, I used to teach anatomy in the first year. Um, you could teach a child, a youngster coming out of school. And they would sit at the back and you thought they were asleep in the class. Uh, and, but they knew the answer to the question. You thought, oh, you got there. You know, what's the answer to that? And they would say, oh, that. And you have a mature student who sits at the front, listens to everything, writes it all down, and you say, what's the answer to that? Oh, ooh, ah. And you can see the difference in the brain when they've been out of learning. But a child who's done GCSEs, A-levels, you know, their brain, you can teach them anything. And we found out, I think it was um, in the first year at college, in anatomy alone, which we used to teach, anatomy alone, you learn 2,000 new words, okay? In the first year, 2,000 new words. When did you last well learn 2,000 new words? <laughs> that's an 18-year-old can learn 2,000 new words in one year, okay? And that's really slow because you learn probably more than that in a week, <laughs> you know, when you were two or three. Okay, so the brain, you know, will continue to grow all the time. We do not wither or learn less as we get older, but you can. Remember that motto, you can stop learning, you can slow it down, or you can speed it up. A sedentary lifestyle is a significant risk factor to memory loss, heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. Exercise therefore becomes more important as we age, not less, okay? Getting young, older people down, down the gym is really more important than anything else. Learnt non-use occurs due to lack of stimulation and exercise. It is seen in people especially who've had strokes. Uh, people learn not to use bits of their brain that don't work. Exercise stops a newly injured system from going down. The quicker you can get people up and up exercising again after injuries, uh, the quicker they're going to get better, and particularly after strokes. Because a lot of people after strokes go then into dementia, uh, depending on what it is. Exercise should be one of the first recommendations made with a person with early signs of Alzheimer's disease or dementia. The worst thing is to decrease activity. So what do they do? They go into a home and they sit and watch television. And all that. Strength training, stretching, and coordinated eye exercises are the most important thing. Coordinated eye exercise. You know the Bates system? Some of you probably know the Bates system. Okay, the Bates system is how to balance the muscles in the back of the eye. Most of the tension that we hold in our system is in the extraocular muscles. Okay, we've got the when those muscles are tight, uh, they pull the eye and change its shape, okay? And what happens is it changes its shape and you change your vision. Remember we were talking about this? So why do so many younger people in their teens, when they're under stress, end up wearing glasses? Because they become short-sighted, don't they? Because what's happened is they've got the tension, because they're under stress, locked into their extraocular muscles and it's stretching them in like a plum tomato instead of a nice plump brown tomato, okay? So it's altering the shape of it. So it's not just the tension in the eyes itself, or the ciliary muscles, which changes our accommodation, but it's actually the tension in the muscles. So the way you do that is to move the eyes, you just look at my finger, without moving the head. Because of course what most people do is they move the head. So this is exactly what I do with you when I do the eye positions. So we take you to there, and back again. And what we found is that when you do that, you're stimulating or contracting the lateral rectus and the medial rectus of the other eye, right? And when I do it that way, you do the opposite. Now, if you've got spasm or tension in one of those muscles, it won't go, will it? Okay, it's not the one that you get, it's the one you're trying to relax and stretch. Remember, Dr. Goodhart said the emphasis should be in the weak muscle not the other muscle. The other muscle is hypertonic, the antagonist muscle. So when we go that way, we're actually stretching the other muscle. And if they go weak when you do that, with the muscle test, it means you've got tension in the antagonist muscle. Okay? So therefore you do the pure movements of, uh, you know, left, 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 right, 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 uh, and then uh, up, across, down, okay? Circumduction is a great one there. And then the good aerobic ones, up and down, which we found was very important for hypoxia and left and right, left and right. But what um, Dr. Bates included then was near uh, vision and far vision. So you look at your fingertip 
and then you look at the horizon off of that, in, out, in, out. So you're exercising the pupillary muscles. But most important was what he took from yoga and Buddhist um, teachings was to palm the eyes. And I'm sure you probably know that. Because when you close your eyes in here, especially, you still get light into the, onto your retina. Okay? Even in a room um, at night time, unless you can shut the curtains and get total darkness, you're going to get some light will come through the retina. So what you do is you put one hand over there and the other hand over there. And that will give you total darkness. Okay, and that's the only way you can get real total darkness is to close your eyes and put one hand on top of the other. It's called palming. Right? And you do that for five minutes. And it rests those extraocular muscles. And the eyes feel so much better because they've lost that stress. And then you do the exercise. So you do the palming, exercise, palming, exercise. And that really stimulates a lot of brain activity, you know. So strength training. Why the strength training? Because it's acetylcholine, isn't it? It stimulates the acetylcholine the neuromuscular. Stretching obviously keeps the blood flowing, keeps the fascia stretched. Walking three times a week at least for 45 minutes each time is the goal. You start with small amounts. It doesn't matter what the person says, oh, I can do more than that. They start with 10 minutes, three times a week for the first couple of minutes. Then you build it up by 10 minutes every two weeks. And it must be only three times a week because they get tired, particularly if they've got neurological problems like Alzheimer's and dementia. And they may need to be accompanied. Obviously, a lot of people will say, <laughs> go and walk downtown, and that's the last you see of them. <laughs> <laughs> so they may need to actually go with somebody. So you know, be sensible on that. But it's, the aim is to do a little bit and build it up. And when they get up to that 45 minutes, well, then they can go faster, but not longer. Okay? So they may achieve more in their time as far as distance, but it's still the same time. So that's what they got to. If they have an injury, something happens, they have to start again. Okay, so if they have a period of time when they don't exercise, you start right at the beginning again. Okay? You don't start where you left off because that's too much of a stress on the body again. So that's the sort of general starting. Now, what we know, like Glenn Doman taught us, is that you need to stimulate the five senses, and this is important. That's all you've got to remember. To increase your learning, which is the same if you've got dementia as if you're at school, is to use those five senses. And the more you can use those five senses, the more you'll stimulate, okay? So this is called neuromodulation. And it's my intention to do this as the next seminar, okay, in the summertime. The next thing that we do here is to look at neuromodulation. So what we want to do is to concentrate on how we can stimulate the eyes in the bigger picture. Um, so we'll be looking at the effect of light. And one of the things I was amazed is that I said this morning that the work of Francis Crick, who not only discovered you know, the pathway of the memory to the hippocampus and coming out, he discovered with Watson the structure of the DNA. But he gave a lecture in 1999 on the effect of colour um, frequencies into the brain with brain damaged people. They were looking at how to stimulate the brain in people. And they found that certain colours stimulated neurons. And in studies in neurons in petri dishes, neurons would be attracted towards certain colours and repelled from others. So the theory was that they could stimulate the brain by administering colours. And their idea in 1999 was to put fibre optics into the brain, <laughs> which is a bit drastic. <laughs> yeah. Well, now is in there now. Okay. Uh, and of course, that was all right in rat experiments or any other, but not in humans. But I then looked this up, and of course, when he gave that talk, he was laughed out of existence. Thought, poor old man's gone nuts, you know. But now, universities all over the world are doing this, uh, and they're using, and they're mostly doing it with lasers of particular frequencies and things but they don't know which frequencies to use, or which wavelengths to use, because it's trial and error. How much do they, how much fat has the person got, how deep will the laser go, and so on. Our experience is you don't need to go out of the visual spectrum. I think it's dangerous to go out of the visual spectrum, because it's ionizing on one side with the ultraviolet, and in the infrared they have to wear special goggles, both the patient and the doctor, doing this. That sounds to me as it could be dangerous, okay? And therefore I want to work in the visible spectrum, and 
most important with Crick's ideas uh, of what he said is he, he said you can get genes to express themselves by using colour wavelengths. It's called optogenetics, okay? And that's what I want to teach you a little bit about in the summertime, okay? So how we can use fine colours to stimulate neuronal and genetic pathways. Okay, this is very exciting work, mm -hmm. and because it means that something may not be fixed in stone because you've got a genetic problem, because you may be able to get that gene to express itself with the light, with the right light or wavelength. Okay? That's one way. Sound is another one. Okay? Very important discoveries made with using different tones and sounds to stimulate. The tongue is phenomenal. The tongue experiments which are working on at the moment all over the world to stimulate multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, stroke patients is absolutely phenomenal of electrical stimulation on the tongue. We're all aware of touch because as chiropractors and osteopaths and practitioners, you know, the value of touch and Franklin Kreis's work, all, all people who work with touch is very, very important to the stimulation of the brain. And our friend Michael Allen was telling us, you know, he said, oh, do you know anything about aromatherapy? I said, yeah, Jill Jill's the expert on this. You know, have a chat with her. And he said, I said, why, why are you interested in aromatherapy as a neurologist? And he said, because they're hitting it big time in America now, the neuro group there, of using smell with aromatherapy to stimulate the brain in coma patients. So they just think about, that's what Glenn Doman told us 20 years ago, you know, you stimulate the five senses. And when I thought, well, how do we stimulate the one with the memory? What is the neurotransmitter? And that's the key, is the neurotransmitter primarily, as you learn, is acetylcholine with retrieving the memory. Therefore, we have to do everything which stimulates acetylcholine. And we know that the nicotinic receptor, which is the one in the hippocampus, etc., is the same as the neuromuscular one. So the more we exercise neuromuscularly, uh, the better we get. And this is why I wanted to just sort of share with you the concept that the muscle of the system is all mapped in the brain, as we know, with the homunculus of Penfeld. And so when we work here, we stimulate a little spot up here. When we work here in the mouth, there's an enormous area, you know, that homunculus has got a big mouth and things. And even on the skin, you see the relationship of the skin, as we learn, to the brain with uh, Alex there. <laughs> in the fetal, you don't have to do this with your patients, by the way. It was just a demonstration of the shape of the brain and the, the, and the, and the body. Okay, so APOE4, we're just a uh, bit through there, is a particular form or allele of the apolipoprotein APOE, uh, which is a risk, major genetic risk factor. Whilst it enhances the breakdown of beta amyloid protein, some forms are not very effective at this task, such as the four. Uh, APOE is, is a plasma lipoprotein which plays a basic role in the degradation of particles rich in cholesterol. APOE3 is, ha has in the structure, it has one of the amino acid sequences um, is of arginine and one of them is of cysteine. Um, APOE2 contains two molecules of cysteine, and APOE4 contains no cysteine, but two molecules of arginine. So what? It's just that cysteine is a sulfur-bearing amino acid, and sulfur has three valencies. It has a valency of two, four, and six, which means it's got arms that can reach out to grab aluminium, mercury, cholesterol fragments, and so on. So it's basically it's a detoxifier. Okay? Arginine has no sulfur, and so it doesn't detoxify. So APOE4 is the short straw, and of the constitutional types, this is the red type. Every person who's red will weaken to APOE4. You can't get away from that. Jill said, oh, she's got that predisposition. Find out what it is that will negate that. In your case, it was B6, wasn't it, pyridoxy? Take a little bit more into your diet. Turmeric is very good for that as well, and other spices, by the way. So you can read the rest of that as far as it's concerned. See, there's the, the APOE3, um, uh, APOE2, in the 112th position of the amino acid structure in the DNA, we've got cysteine, 158 is cysteine. APOE3, 158 is arginine, and APOE4, both are arginine. So it enhances amyloid beta protein production. Antioxidants help protect against the stress. It is thought not to be a determinant, in other words, not the cause of Alzheimer's, but maybe a risk factor. So it doesn't mean, in other words, if you're a red person and you're positive to APOE4, you're going to get Alzheimer's. Okay, it doesn't look like that. 
but most people who do get true Alzheimer's are red people and will have the APOE4. Epigenetic intervention can give powerful intervention to help, especially with single nucleotide polymorphisms. In other words, if you've got, you need extra pyridoxal 5-phosphate or adenosylcobalamin, methylcobalamin, etc. Methylation means adding a CH2 to the, to the gene, which means basically keeping the cap on the gene and stop genes that we may have inherited from expressing themselves. And we form methyl groups from what's called S adenosyl methionine, which we make from methionine, and en route to making the amino acid cysteine, we make homocysteine. So homocysteine, if it's not metabolized this way, will have to be recycled back here where we need B12. And B12, to get the methyl group onto B12, we need folic acid. So folic acid and B12 are considered to be methylating groups. And pyridoxal 5-phosphate here, or B6, metabolizes homocysteine to cysteine. So homocysteine high levels have been shown to break down collagen, which it, it creates problems with arterial walls, which makes people predisposed to vascular problems and, uh, and strokes. So high homocysteine is a problem. So high homocysteine, we need to metabolize high homocysteine down to cysteine. So this pathway is B6 and vitamin C dependent. So people with high homocysteine should take vitamin C and or B6, okay, in different forms. That would be the answer to this. On the other hand, some people want to recycle this and create more S adenosyl methionine, in which case homocysteine is low because you don't want this pathway to be open too much. So some people strengthen the homocysteine because they want to keep recycling it to make more methyl groups. That would be cancer cases. Cancer cases, if they've got a gene of a cancer gene, you want to keep the cap on, don't you? Right? You don't want to express the cap. You want to open the cap of the suppressor gene, but not the gene that carries the bad news. Okay? You want to keep the cap, and the cap is a methyl group, which is made from S-adenosyl methionine. So these people like homocysteine. That's why we have the pathway in the first place. Okay? So too much homocysteine is bad for people with cardiovascular problems, but you need homocysteine to be able to recycle it with the B12 and the folate for people with cancer. All right? So all things in the body are good and bad if they're in too high or too low. Uh, and the final part there is really is lack of oxygen. So this is one of the most important parts of looking at the person as a whole, is do they get enough oxygen into their brain? So remember, it uses 20% of all the oxygen in the whole body, although it's the smallest organ. And hypoxia means a lack of oxygen. It doesn't mean anoxia or no oxygen. That would be, you know, we'd be soon be dead. So we can get a variety of symptoms, ranging, of course, from lightheadedness and memory loss, etc., to that. So we can measure it with oximeters. You remember we've done this in previous seminars where we measure on the, on the nail bed. Very cheap. You can buy these for about 20, 20 pounds off Amazon. And you put it on the nail bed on one hand and on the other. And you see, and most people come up with 99%. On a bad day, you may drop down to 97, but you're not too bad. But if you go to 93, 94, you could be in quite severe hypoxia. So what we find is oxygen from the air, because that's where it comes from, has to go into the lungs, okay? And the pressure in your lungs is greater than the pressure in the cell by the side of your big toe, which is where it's got to get to, or in the middle of your brain, okay? So what happens is the oxygen diffuses, as Jill said, Nothing transports oxygen, it's simply the pressure is greater. And it diffuses across the phospholipids of the lung alveola. Okay. It diffuses across the phospholipids of the blood vessels, the pulmonary artery. It diffuses across the phospholipid structure of the red blood cells. And what's in the red blood cell is hemoglobin. Okay. So the two most important things to getting oxygen to your big toe, or the middle of your brain, is, is your phospholipids right? Because if you're hardened, because you've got trans fats, the wrong fats, the oxidized uh, trans fats, hydrogenated vegetables, all that sort of crap, you're not going to get the oxygen across easily. Okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing, have you got the hemoglobin to transport it? Can the hemoglobin, is the hemoglobin made? Or have you got a problem there, a porphyria or a pyrrolurea dysfunction, 
where you're not able to carry oxygen or not able to make heme in sufficient amounts to make hemoglobin. And if that is the case and you're hypoxic, it means that all the heme enzymes in the body will be down as well because you can't make heme. If you can't make hemoglobin, you can't make catalase, myeloperoxidase, cytochrome P450, cytochrome C, cytochrome C oxidase. Um, there's one that thyroid um, uh, uh, peroxidase, which convert, make, make, converts py, uh, tyrosine into thyroxine. That's a heme-dependent enzyme. Sulfite oxidase, that's one of the worst ones you can have because you can't drink sulfite wine. <coughs> it's disastrous. Beers and wines have sulfates put in to kill the yeast. And sulfite oxidase enzyme is a heme-dependent one. So you're gasping for breath and you can't even have a drink. <laughs> you have to stick with spirits because they've got no, nothing there. So this is why people who, some people can't, they can drink spirits, but they can't drink wines or beers. They get a stinking headache and things. These people have got heme problems because they can't, they haven't made the enzyme. Heme is most, most important. If you haven't heard about this before, go back on the website and watch the, watch the, um, the last couple of seminars that we did in the summer. One was on hypoxia and the other one on phonocardiography where we studied it uh, in detail, just how important it is. And the most important things, factors are, to look at haemoglobin is to obviously test it with heme. But most important was the um, B6, pyridoxal 5-phosphate. Sometimes there's a little bit of folate in there and adenosyl cobalamin. So have a look at that chart because that's really, really important. And if you can't make heme, you get a buildup of these intermediates, or porphyrins they're called, which make people very sensitive to the violet end of the spectrum. Do you remember we did that with the colours, with the violet uh, coloured acetate? And these are people who convert the porphyrins, particularly europorphyrinogen or um, coproporphyrinogen here, um, into creating free radicals, uh, superoxide, which damages the light-sensitive areas in the body, and that's particularly the retina of the eye. So this is the development of macular degeneration and other problems of the eye. So hemoglobin is important, phospholipids are important. What makes a phospholipid? Well, we spent most of the day doing that, didn't we, this morning. The omega-6 oils, like evening primrose, black currant seed, borage, uh, all the other ones here. And then as we come down, we've got the omega-3. We should add DHA in there. I don't know where DHA has gone. Wheat germ oil and so on. So those are the sort of oils. But I think the prime one that you've learned today is DHA is much more um, deficient in people than what we'd ever imagined. Okay. Don't just test DHA by testing fish oil. That's the lesson. Because a person doesn't strengthen the fish oil doesn't mean they're not hideously deficient in DHA. Okay. They just want the DHA and not the EPA. That's the important thing. So oxygen in the air gets to the red blood cell, gets to the tissue, and then it has to cross the tissue, having got there, into the mitochondria. Across, and all these are different membranes with different phospholipids. Okay, so that's important. Having got into the mitochondria, it then goes through the process and the Krebs cycle goes whizzes round and it produces carbon dioxide. And the pressure of the carbon dioxide in the cell is greater than the atmospheric carbon dioxide, which is 0.3%. So in the tissue, when it's done its respiration, it creates carbon dioxide, which is greater than the amount here. So it flows the other way by diffusion. And the same molecular structure, the hemoglobin, carries it the other way. So hemoglobin carries oxygen to the tissue and carries carbon dioxide by diffusion back again. Wonderful, isn't it? It's the importance of blood, really. You know, it's a somewhat important substance. <laughs> they found they can't do without it. So that's hemoglobin and myoglobin, both of which, remember, are heme-dependent enzymes, along with catalase, myeloperoxidase, eosinophil peroxidase, and other peroxidase, nitric oxide synthase, cystothione to get rid of um, homocysteine, cytochrome P450, cytochromes, uh, in other words, cytochrome C oxidase, etc., sulfide oxidase, thyroperoxidase, and the cyclooxygenase ones in the um, prostaglandin cycles as well. They're all heme. So that's the chart there. That's the, we won't spend time on this. We need two days. Uh, Alzheimer's has been linked to porphyria. That's the build-up of partial um, uh, heme derivatives. In other words, somebody who's not making heme completely to get a build-up of porphyria. In 2004, some 4.5 million Americans were said to have the disease. By 85, one out of two Americans has Alzheimer's. What a future. <laughs> what a cost to the health. No wonder their health costs are so high. They're insured. Uh, so myelin 
Yeah, myelin damage looking at B12. We've talked about D12. Okay, so... Yeah, propionic acid. This is another thing we learned. Propionic acid is a stool analysis showed much higher levels in Europeans than in Africans uh, in Africa. But Africans in America and in Europe show again high propionic acid. And propionic acid adversely influences brain function. It's a carbon-3. It's a saturated oil, which is an odd number, and is popped into the Krebs cycle at succinyl-CoA. But to pop it into the Krebs cycle, you need B12. And you need specifically adenosyl cobalamin. So people who've got low in adenosyl cobalamin will show potentially high in propionic acid, which can influence brain function. So that's the sort of gut-brain link.